I mean, I don't think there was much conversation about being a Jewish athlete before the Olympics started. Um, there certainly wasn't any talk about the fact that Dachau, a concentration camp, was just a few miles away from the swim hall and the track stadium and whatever. I mean, I think this was a big coming out of, of, the, of the modern age at the time to show, you know, here we are, um, this is the new Olympics, this is, uh, you know, this is, what, this is where the world is today. Little did anybody know that a week into the Olympic Games, this was going to happen. So I was thrust in a unique situation. In one sense, you know, was I a spokesperson for who? You know, to be a Jew? Well, that's kind of an interesting position to put some pressure on somebody who's 22 years old. I wasn't a rabbi. I wasn't involved with uh, an expert uh, set of uh, tools and knowledge about a lot of things that basically answer questions in a, in a, in a way that may have been expected of me. I did the best that I could at the time. It, it, today, it's still the same answer, which is it was a terrible tragedy for not only those athletes, uh, but for the Olympic movement and for the families in particular. Um, and we're still talking about it today. We could see on these monitors, this guy, because they had these telephoto actual lenses from the press center directly into the village. And you could see clear as day this guy out on a balcony with some kind of a Panama hat leaning over talking to somebody that was a hostess just the floor below. And they had a lot of these hostess kind of dressed up in Bavarian outfits uh, just to help the athletes to go, well, where's this, where's that? Kind of directors, you know, it's really well orchestrated the whole concept of the Olympics back in that day. But we found out later that she was a crisis negotiator and she was talking with this person. It took from about 11 o'clock in the morning until about three or four in the afternoon to have a dis definitive plan. So my coach and I basically were taken down into the parking lot area because this was a big apartment complex that had all this parking, but nobody was ever parked there because this was, all the athletes didn't have cars, you know, nobody was, there was no residence there to speak of. And we were put in a Mercedes, I remember, in the back seat, and there was like this army blanket, and they put it, they told me to crouch down in the back seat and then put this blanket over me because the press now was looking at any cars that were moving in and out of the village. So the only people in the car were uh, a guard with a gun and then the driver and then my coach. So it just looked like there were three people in the car. And then we drove, and then they told me after about five minutes, you know, okay, fine, you know, set up. And we were driven to the airport. Uh, the public airport, and, and then we were on a plane to London. When we got to London, we were taken to a particular hotel and in downtown London, uh, and I was in the room with my coach, Sherm Shavor, who, by the way, was the head women's coach of the Olympic team, who was also my personal coach, um, and uh, we woke up in the morning. There was a guard outside the door. Um, all night long. Before we went to bed, he says, God, you're, da you're dangerous to, f to be around. I go, well, I was actually thinking the same thing around you, just as a joke. I mean, we didn't know what was going on. Yeah, I, I had an interesting opportunity to meet um, a couple of the wives um, of the slain athletes uh, when I was in Israel, and, and, and two of their, their children in particular. I think one of them was born and one of them, one of the wives was pregnant uh, during the course of that. It was 13 years later, and the funny thing is is that I, I wasn't a surrogate father, but they related to me in a very big way. One, that I was Jewish, and number two, I was at the same Olympics with their fathers. It was the mystery, the magic, the wonder, and the innocence of never having done that before that created the seeds of creativity of how I formulated my dreams. And that's the direction I took. Um, it was a wonder to be a swimmer. The magic of like, what and how do I get to the Olympic Games? Uh, everything about that you had never done something like that before. You have to create in your mind some vision of that that's the road you want to go. That, that is your dreams. But a dream doesn't mean anything unless you react to that dream and do something about it. Because other than that, if you don't, it just always remains a dream. The fact that we obviously have a little more than 250 programs worldwide in 50 countries, there's 
a little more than six million people that have come through the program. I mean, it, this isn't about developing professional athletes. This isn't about developing Olympians, although that could happen in a roundabout way. It's giving people that didn't have a chance an opportunity um, to, to, to be and pay attention to themselves and work on their self-esteem.